All right, so like you mentioned, my name is Patrick Cowan. Um, I'm here to talk about a risk-based approach to determine hydrographic survey priorities using GIS. And I, I couldn't start this without giving major mention to the other team members that are involved in this project. Uh, we have Lieutenant Commander Mike Gonzalez, uh, Corey Allen, Christina Fandel, uh, Barry Gallagher, and Lucy Hick. Uh, this, this project wouldn't be on its way to completion without the rest of the people um, on this slide. So good to mention them. Uh, so moving forward, uh, just a quick overview. I'm going to do a, a little background about our NHSP document, just in case anybody hasn't either heard of it or isn't very familiar. Then do an overview of the new hydrographic health model, which is basically the, the term to um, describe what was just on that first presentation slide. And then go through the data sources, the methods, uh, the desired survey score and present survey score, which make up our hydrographic gap and then go into the hydrographic risk portion of the model and then kind of show a quick results. And it's good to mention everything you're gonna see, there is, we don't love Florida, there's not a reason other than the fact that we're trying to scale this up. So the slides you're gonna see, all the data is for the state of Florida, um, but, but that's only because this is kind of step two in a three-step process. Uh, we, we took a project that was up in the Arctic, worked on that for a little while, got some great praise from that, so dug in, tried to develop this, and decided that instead of going nationwide at first, we needed to do a test data set. We used Florida, and then now we're in the middle of now working into a national model. Um, and with that, we'll go into that kind of second to last bullet point there. This big data, big problems. You know, we, we have a lot of this data, but we have a lot of issues trying to convert 50 plus million points for just one UTM zone. Um, when you multiply that out for AIS traffic, you're talking hundreds of millions of points. It's just problems processing that kind of data on you know, personal machines. And then we'll get into future work. So just a little background here. Everybody's probably heard this first term. You know, the USEEZ is 3.4 square nautical miles. Of that, approximately 44,000 we've surveyed to modern standards. And then every year we can survey about 3,000 square nautical miles. And that's with our in-house units and our contracts. So it goes to show that, you know, obviously we're resource limited. We're not going to survey every inch of the ocean. We got to be smart about where we're going to survey and how we're going to decide to do that. And ultimately the goal, you know, we need to maximize the hydrographic return on investments. We can't send these million dollar assets out, collect data, and then realize, well, somebody else has already collected data here or we just didn't need data there. And I'll actually get to that point later on in one of the slides. It's some of this project has kind of shown us that maybe in the past, based on our new criteria, we might have actually done that on accident. So just a quick overview of our National Hydrographic Survey Priorities. Uh, it was a document that was put out in 1994, basically just ranked critical through priority five areas, and those were based on depth, survey quality, and vessel traffic. And it's kind of good to note that the original data was all stored in map info. So even though there was some spatial component, you know, I say that we're moving in a GIS that was there in the past, but it wasn't all there. A lot of the dis determinations on the areas that we were going to, you know, rank as critical or rank as priority five, those decisions were made off non geospatial data sets. They were just, you know, hey, this looks like a good area based on constituent concern. We're going to mark this and then we're gonna leave it. And that kind of goes into the next slide. As we evolved into the 2012 edition, we updated the kind of emerging needs and things that were brought to our attention as emerging critical, but we didn't go back and change any of the old decisions we had made. We didn't remove things from critical areas. We didn't move priority five up to priority one or drop one to five. You know, none of that was done. And that really gets into the overall limitations of that document. You know, it was, it was lacking some of the geospatial data that could have been there. We just didn't have the ability to, to input a lot of that at the time. It was agnostic to consequence. And then the individual coverage requirements weren't specifically addressed. You know, we couldn't go port to port and say, well, we need full bottom coverage here or we need object detection here. We really had no way to go in and out of that. And then last but not least, there's no mechanism for managing resurvey work. So, Areas that we wanted to go back and resurvey in, you know, we listed them as resurvey, and that was, again, that was the end. This, this was a one-and-done document. We weren't going to redo anything. 
So moving into our new process, the hydrographic health model, kind of some of the benefits here that we're going to see, the repeatability of it, the scalability, which is already being seen um, just based on the way we've moved through from the Arctic to Florida and now about to finish up the nationwide model, um, and the simple fact that it's analytical. You know, in the past, again, we weren't using GIS at the, at the real extent that it could be used to make decisions based on areas that we should head to. And the data is authoritative, at least whenever possible. You know, we're not out here making up data sets. You'll see in the next slide when I go over the inputs, you know, most of these are from federal agencies or from um, different authoritative sources. You know, in the past, a lot of times decisions were just made because somebody went out, they beat the street, they got an opinion, they wrote it down, and then they implemented that. So we're really trying to get away from that, at least in the model's perspective, and really be authoritative and analytical. And then it's going to be modular. That's one of the things we really want to pose is that any other hydrographic organization could take the result or take the model, change some different input parameters, and then make this their own. And then just an added benefit, just the way GIS is evolving and coming into really a public sector, we're able to put everything we do out onto story maps, RGS services, anything to get it out in the public's hands instead of carrying around this big, and I meant to bring it with me, the big thick book that we used to, to put out. So here's just some of the data sets. Um, I'll get to some of these more in depth when I go over some of the challenges we had. Uh, but like I mentioned, you know, most of these, obviously being NOAA, are from us. Um, a lot of other ones, though, can, it can come from any source. You know, we take tidal currents from Georgia Tech. It just happened to be the best place that we could find data that was in a format that we could readily use. So overall, this is the model of hydrographic health that we came up with. So it's two major concepts. We have the hydrographic gap on the left, which takes in the desired survey score, what we want, and the present survey score, what we have. And then basically, at the end of the day, the larger the gap, the worse the hydrographic health. And then you move over to the right-hand side here, and you have the hydrographic risk. So that's modeled as the risk to surface navigation due to inaccurate depths and unknown hazards. And the same with the hydrographic gap. The greater the risk, the worse hydrographic health. There's kind of no way around either one of those. Um, and it's good to note, just because these are here, the gap and the risk, these do not take into effect constituent concerns, emergency requests, you know, things that come up every day that we can't just model those things. Those are, that's why we call this the beginning of the story and not the end. Because this will give us a map at the end of the day that's going to show a bunch of areas we should go survey and that still not, might, might not be where we need to go. So. So I'm just going to kind of shift through and go through each aspect of the model. Um, I'm going to try to do this quick because there's a lot of slides. So if you have any questions, just ask at the end or come see me uh, this afternoon. So first, the desired survey score. Really, this is just a function of the underkill clearance and then the C4 complexity. So we combine both of those, and we get a desired survey score here, which is 100% linked to the type of data that we would want to collect or the type of data that we can maybe get. And this is really where outside source data can come in, because if we have an area that falls into this desired lesser coverage, there's no reason that we can't go out, take a lot of outside source data, start applying that data, and the health jumps up. And these are some of the things that we're hoping to ground truth um, later on by starting to introduce a lot of those outside source data sets. So then we move into the present survey score, which is just a combination of the initial quality and the changeability in the area and the time elapsed since the last survey. And the initial survey quality is strictly a function of the CATSOC. So we basically extract the CATSOC values and come down to a type of coverage that was acquired and gives us the initial survey score. And then kind of this next slide, I'm. I'm really going to not claim to be the expert here. I will defer all of this to Lieutenant Commander Mike Gonzalez. This is really his brainchild, this decay coefficient. But it really, at its simplest, the most basic form, having one of these change terms at any time, storms, currents, human debris, human debris in our case, having any of those set to a maximum will then result in a Katzok A survey area degrading to a Katzok B in 10 years. And then you can kind of see here what happens. This is, this is kind of the thought process we used to have, initial survey quality. We survey it, it's done, it's going to be like that. We just got to get all the critical done. 
Well, this is what happens when you get all the depreciation terms involved. This is the present survey score. So just because we surveyed an area with object detection 10 years ago, that doesn't mean today that it's still, we still have that same um, quality in mind. So this just kind of shows how everything degraded. Another way to look at this is instead of doing past to present, we can do present to future. So we can take one of these areas and we can take all the terms and set them to perfect. So this shows, you know, we fully surveyed all of Florida. This, is, this was the goal if we would have ever finished all that critical area, all the P1 through P5, everything we ever needed to do, we surveyed everything. But then what happens over time, and that's what we can kind of get into with the decay co coefficient. You see Catsock A goes to Catsock B in 10 years, so now you start to see these areas pop up that we would need to go do uh, new survey work in. So one of the things you can start to do from a planning perspective, you can do the analytics on this. You can get up to you know, 6,500 square nautical miles of Catsock A degraded to Catsock B. You can kind of see over here, add all this up. Then you go back to the desire and you find out, well, I really wanted 1,200 square nautical miles to remain Catsock A in that area. So then you can just do the simple math, imply that you should plan to survey 120 square nautical, 120 square nautical miles in Florida every year to, ma to maintain the desired state that you wanted. And this is really, I think we're going to try to ground truth a lot of this as well, but this is really one of the things that we're looking forward to is, is finding out, you know, how much time do we have to spend in an area because we have limited resources, we can only send them so many places, and two of our ships are located on one coast, the other two are on another coast. So really we have to get down to these ideas of where can we go to really maximize the return on investment and keep the areas up to date that we want to keep up to date. So just kind of moving into the hydrographic gap as a whole, uh, desired minus present survey score, really this is where I got back to, you know, there could be an institutional inefficiency that we find. No gap doesn't always mean that we're, we're done and we did the best we could. Sometimes no gap can mean that we over-surveyed an area. Um, we wouldn't have known this in the past because we weren't using the same criteria that we're going to use now. But this is, these are the things we're going to start to see is that, you know, maybe we spent way too much time in an area that we're now deeming to not need as much coverage in. And so kind of the last note on that, it really should just end the concept of the one and done hydrography. That's, that's what we always thought. If we got all the critical done, we were done, what do we do now? Do we all lose our jobs? What do we do? Well, no, because again, nothing stays the same forever. So then going on to the other side of the spectrum, kind of the, the whole risk, hydrographic risk, we have the consequence and the likelihood. So the total risk is gonna be the risk to the ship, the risk to commerce, the risk to the environment. So you'll kind of see all the consequence um, parameters that we have here and the likelihood parameters. And the grayed out ones are just ones that, you know, during our huge planning session, we were going to include all of these. It really got down to the wire, especially on the Florida model, and we just couldn't get the data sets in the kind of processed arena that we wanted, so we had to move on. But these are things that, that we hope to include in the future. And a lot of these things like impact to tourism, you don't just go get that data set. These, these are things that have to be you know, discussed with you know, other people in commerce. We got a data set, then you have to discuss it, then you really have to ground truth those types of things. And so one thing I didn't mention, the modular nature, that this is where we think that this whole thing could be really picked up and moved to another hydrographic office. And kind of one of those scenarios we saw, we had spoken with other hydrographic offices that were starting to venture down the same path and they said the same thing. They said, well, you can take our model and do the same thing. And they were, took a little different approach. I think their whole idea was really to focus on tourism where we were trying to focus on, you know, the impact of surface navigation. But you could easily weight these things differently, change them in and out, and then use that for your own, you know, technique. So just to go through a couple of the consequences, uh, this is reefs and sanctuaries, and you can see that these are dependent on vessel type. So we made the decision early on that something like, you know, an impact to a reef and a sanctuary obviously is going to be larger with tanker vessels present than with other types of vessels. 
So we're able to classify all of this down based on ship type and get down to these kind of five and six structures that then go into other portions of the model. So moving on to likelihood, um, I'm going to kind of go through two examples here because the likelihoods really seem to drive more. Um, this one is due to the reported hazards. These, we decided to take a distance and density approach. So we decided what is the maximum amount of distance that we care about and then how many in that area will make that of a greater concern. So when it comes down to the, the bottom line here, you want the maximum of the PAPDs, which are on our nautical charts as discrepancies that people have reported in, or the reported have been reported in, the PAPDs, we don't have exact locations, but we know they're in the general area. So we take the max of any of these and we get down to kind of these levels again. So you'll kind of see these classifications zero to five and one through five come up a lot. So our next one, you know, traffic density. It's the big one right now. It's what everybody's talking about. AS traffic, you know, obviously the likelihood's higher the more traffic there is. I mean, it works on the waterways just like it does on the highways. So you see here, obviously going in and out of Tampa, there's a ton of traffic going up and down the channel. Obviously the likelihood is going to be of something happening there is going to be a lot higher in the middle of the channel. But then you also start to see what we saw well, there's some discrepancies. We have some issues with anchorage areas. We have, you know, out here, we have some secret fishing spots. Out here, we have some ferry routes down here. This isn't very conducive to a model that you're really trying to make sure everything's kind of fair. So this is one of the things I'll get into later when I talk about kind of problems we had. Obviously, getting traffic density and count is a very easy process. A bunch of grid or a bunch of um, points in a grid cell, easy to get to, but how do we get rid of the fact that the same exact boat is pinging constantly in the same spot? So that's when we have to go to unique count and base that on the, the ship's MMSI. So you'll see here, I mentioned again, you got the moored vessels, the ferry routes, the anchorage areas, and then the, we found when we pulled our nautical chart up, that's actually a fish haven. So that is somebody's secret fishing spot or our you know, vessels going out to monitor the habitat. But then when you do the unique count, you lose all of that, which is good for us. You go into where the traffic is actually navigating, not where they're sitting. Um, and again, this is a problem that came up because it's easy to get the density. It's easy to get the ones and zeros. It's not as easy to go through and get the whole, well, I need, you know, one MMSI per grid node. So then that brings us back to kind of the, the final result, the hydrographic health. So this is the hydrographic gap modeled. This is the hydrographic risk. When you add those two together, you get our kind of final product here of what the area in Florida all the way up to Savannah, what the hydrographic health of that area is, and slightly ignore the extremely odd numbers on here. We're slowly fixing this portion of the model but it still makes sense. You know, we have areas right in here that are the highest issue that we're gonna have to deal with. And then we have the areas out here, obviously, as you get less traffic, the deeper the water gets, you stop caring as much. So these are areas that we could start really focusing on using outside source data or, you know, any other type of data that we can get. We may not need object detection coverage out here. And one of the other things that we're really trying to deal with is, what do you do about this? We can't just go out and survey this 1.1%, and we can't go survey this one square nautical mile. We can't, we can't get assets out to, to survey one square nautical mile. It's just way too expensive. It's extremely inefficient. So we have to start grouping these things together and figuring out you know, how can we do more in this area but not maybe utilize the entire asset. Maybe we, we make plans to only do partial bottom coverage, which means they can cover twice the amount of area. So those are some of the things that we're working out. And again, we're working on this um, very odd math that happened there. So what I want to trans transition into next is just some of the problems we've had. And I don't want it to be the, the bad Esri thing 
I don't want it to be any of that. Basically, I just want to go over some of the issues we've had with Esri. We've worked with them to try to fix some of those, how we worked around them. And then really the hope is, you know, we're not, we're not the experts here. There's a lot of people in this room that have dealt with big data. They dealt with a lot of these problems that we haven't had a chance to talk to. So if anybody has any solutions, please let me know. Um, I'll rush through just a couple of these. Obviously, we're not GIS programmers. So when we had to transition to things like Python, we didn't have skills in that. We have to rely on people that are in different offices. They may not have a lot of time to help us work through those problems. You know, we just transitioned to Esri a couple years ago, on and on and on. So obviously, we were not set up to do this right away. So here's just the inputs again. There's a couple um, AIS reporting hazards and hurricanes or storms. I want to just cover those really quick. And obviously, there, there's benefits. There's huge gains that we found in using Edry products. Number one, they were repeatable. They were transferable. They were really easy to learn. We could get anybody in the office to all of a sudden sit down and run through a couple of these data sets like sanctuaries, ports, bottom types. Um, one of the ones kind of unique, AS unique count, we can't maybe just give that to anyone, but we can use Esri products to, to really manually grunt through that, that process. Some of the limitations we have, though, is you know, the unique count. There, there's not a one-step process to this. You have to go through a couple iterations of a different geoprocessing tool to get there. Um, we also couldn't see physical memory up front what would be maxed out. So a lot of times we'd run a process, it would run for 24 hours, nothing would happen. And we would find out that it was just maxing out your physical memory and you couldn't do anything about that. And then one of our bigger things that we found in, that was beneficial using some Python scripts that we couldn't do in Esri is troubleshoot a lot of the geoprocessing failures. When you get the negative 999 error, there's not a lot you can do with that. You just start again, try over. But with Python, we were able to get around a lot of that because it would give us you know, the error codes that we wanted back. We could find the line of code and then move forward. So big data, big problems. Obviously, AS is a huge data set. There's millions upon millions, hundreds of millions of points. We're trying to run through these and extract values out of depth grids and then return those back into the data set. So this is something that Esri just didn't like. I think it, it just didn't like it in its own geoprocessing environment. When you introduce Python scripting to call the Arc tools, it loved it. It ran through it in seconds. And this was just one of those ways that we found to work around some of the issues that we were finding in desktop and in pro, but yet seem to just call on them through Python and they would work fine. Um, again, I, I can kind of talk more about this if anybody has questions. Our storms data set, that was an interesting one because originally we thought it would be no problem at all. There's just a bunch of lines. They'll run through them. No big deal. Then we realized we wanted to buffer the lines into polygons because we don't just care about that small storm track. We care about a lot of the area around that. So then when you introduce polygons, it's a whole nother ball game of trying to overlap things and get counts. And then we also had missing tools. So we couldn't find a good supersession routine to deal with our CATSOC, CERDEX, our age of survey, things like that. We had the AIS problem with not having the one step you need count. And then we had distance versus density. This is one that we had to create in Python that was just something that we felt like maybe should have already been there. And again, maybe it is. We just didn't get to the right person at the right time um, to figure out what that was. So I kind of mentioned this. Again, Python scripting helped us a lot. Our biggest issues were just big data. And one of the caveats that I don't think I mentioned is, you know, we're a federal agency. We can't just all of a sudden go start using cloud you know, based services. It's not something that we have at our fingertips. So we have to try to work around those problems. A year from now, we could set those things up and move forward, but it's just not something we can do. So I kind of went over the storms. Again, this was just something that Python was able to really help us. And then one of my last mentions, um, ArcGIS Pro, although it's not really listed to improve your processing time, it was really doubling and tripling our processing speeds for some reason. I think just the dedication of the multi-threading, it, it helped a lot with a lot of things that we couldn't do. And a lot of things that used to max out memory were not maxing out memory anymore. So just kind of moving on. There are limitations. Again, I said we don't have programmers on site. We can't just call up some people to write some Python scripts and move on. We're trying to build this capability in-house, but 
It's not something we have right now, and development can take a really long time. So our future work, we're currently expanding to the US. Uh, we need to build and implement a communication plan. I mean, this is something we had to do with the old document. This is something that goes to Congress on how we're going to make decisions on where we survey. Then we're in the process of submitting a paper to the IHR. Um, we're going to ground truth a lot of these data sets, especially the changeability model. I mean, that's something we get asked questions every day. It hasn't been ground truth. We have to get to that point, but we want to get a first run out before we go and do any of that. And then we have to build a maintenance plan. We can't just spend all of our time getting this first iteration in and then drop this. So, And that is it. And I might have actually used up question time, you think? We, we got time for one question. One question. Anybody? Bueller? Yep. The numbers where you go from a cat's A to a cat's B, those degradation numbers, how did you arrive at those? So that decay coefficient, I really am going to have to defer to Mike Gonzalez on that. It was, it was something that I was not really involved in kind of generating that decay coefficient. Um, I could flip it back. We could definitely discuss after. I can give you his contact information. And then I can flip back to the slide. It kind of has like an overview of how that um, coefficient comes into play. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you.